return to Isaiah 6. We delve into a bit of the year that Uzziah died as a time stamp to the death and compared it to the death of, of Judah, which kind of alerts us to the need for um, judgment, uh, the need for someone to go and proclaim the word of God to a people that have uh, strayed away. And, you know, in these first five uh, uh, chapters, even beginning in this chapter uh, six, as we look at Uzziah, it seems like there's just no hope for these folks. But I, I'm always encouraged by Isaiah because Isaiah preached uh, 40 some odd years must have been a discouraging uh, time for him because despite for all the 43 years of his preaching, uh, Judah still went into captivity. Uh, that's, a sad, that's a sad commentary, isn't it? To hear the word that long and not change. A lot of times when we read Isaiah, it, but we get confused because of the repetition that's, that appears to be in it. And, the going back and forth, and sometimes the themes don't just line up in a chronological order. But it shows that at different times, uh, different emphasis were made, and, and then Isaiah had to go back and do it again and do it again and do it again, and, and still uh, they, they didn't get it. And so uh, Uzziah, kind of uh, the year of, that Uzziah died, helps us to understand when um, uh, Isaiah was called. In other words, they didn't have a calendar like you and I. They, they wouldn't say in, uh, in August of the 3rd of, of 720 B.C., Isaiah was, uh, was called. They would have a significant event that would label that. Now, I will say that this time of Isaiah uh, in history can be tracked uh, and a date could actually be affixed to that. And matter of fact, it kind of helps us if we're going to try to figure out the age of the world and all of that kind of stuff if you're into that. But it, it's a fixed date. And so we know how long it was from here to Christ, how long it was going back as, as you fix that date and then calculate it back. We're not here to do that tonight, though. We're here to open up the vision of, um, of Isaiah and maybe glean from that uh, some things that uh, will help us in regaining the holiness that God desires uh, of his church. I want to pick up again in this verse, si uh, chapter 6 and verse 1. We only dealt with Uzziah, but the whole verse reads, in the year... Uh, that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord upon his throne high and lifted up, and his train filled with the temple. Uh, one of the things that we're going to see in this is how we view God is how we follow him. How we view God is how we worship him. And so we must see God as he is and as he is wanting to reveal himself to us. God does not have any pets. Amen? In other words, I'm not talking about animals, but those who he deems he wants close to him, so he draws them into himself, and others he pushes away. He'll reveal himself to whoever it is who wants to know. Did you know that? It doesn't matter where we're at. He, he is anxious to have a, a relationship with us and fellowship with us. Otherwise, he wouldn't have saved us. Amen? And Scripture tells us not many wise and not many of the princes of this world will call, not many of the intellectuals, and it goes on and on to say 
that uh, in essence he's called common people and he wants to be with his people with the the people that he has created and so during this year it says that uh, Uzziah died he saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and and immediately it comes to our mind what did he see <laughs> well I think we have to put this in perspective don't we that is uh, uh, Exodus 33 20 says uh, that that thou, uh, God told Moses, you can't see my face because no man has seen my face and lived. Jesus reiterated that when he said, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So how did Isaiah see God. It certainly was not with his natural eyes. And so we're going inside and saying that God revealed himself the only way God can. And it fits so well within what we're doing in these last few months or so about praying in the spirit, walking in the spirit. God is a spirit. And if we're going to see him, then we've got to see him in the spirit man. We've got to see him for who he is. And that's what, that's what happened here with, with Isaiah. He saw him as the Lord. He saw him as his master. He saw him as Jehovah, who is the, the creator of everything and all things. He said, I saw the Lord, and he was sitting upon the throne. And God sits in this place of, of power and authority, and yet he sits in no place. Because he cannot be confined to any single location. Wherever God is, is his throne. Wherever his presence is, is his throne, is his authority. And so what, 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 uh, what Isaiah is seeing is this is the end of all things. There is no power past him. There's no authority that he goes to and seeks counsel from. Uh, he is it. And he saw him that way. Uh, he sits in a place where uh, also where authority flows out from him. Uh, I've mentioned several times in, in this message, mentioned it again this morning, that no man has any kind of a inherent authority over another man. That's simply because there is no man uh, that is superior to any other, other man. That's just not so. And it's a condition of pride that makes one man think he's better than another. And it's a great cause of the conflict in the world today, isn't it? Where for whatever the reason is, and we could sure list a lot of them, why people think they're better or they think somebody else is less than they are. Uh, we could list those things. But that's not true. And what God does is he gives that authority uh, to some folks. Now, when he does that, he... He's doing that for his purpose. For example, you know, Romans 13 tells us there's no power except that which is of God. And then it says that God gives this power to his ministers. His ministers, in this case, are governmental leaders. Now, no matter what we think about them, the Bible says they're there for our good. As bad as things are in this world, can you imagine what would happen if we didn't have any police, can you imagine where we'd be if we didn't have a strong military? Can you imagine where we would be if we did not have a government? As bad as it is, it actually does do us good. Amen? There, there seems to be some doubt. <laughs> well, if you say so. <laughs> I mean, we got roads, we've got electricity. You didn't do that. I didn't put those in. We got flowing water. We got food that most of the time is okay. We've got uh, hospitals that are regulated. That's a lot of good. Depends on what we see. You see, we're we're we are are generally a negative people. We always default, and you, you, you can bear this out. You get in a conversation with somebody, and if there's a negative, 
if there's a negative thought there, we jump immediately on it and start amplifying it. We don't do that with the truth. <laughs> truth doesn't take that long to talk about, maybe. Amen. And so he sees this, the, the Lord. He's high and he's on his throne. He's all powerful. And, and he has all authority. Uh, he's high and lifted up in the midst of the dark world. We need to see the Lord as our, as our God that is high and lifted above the darkness that we see. We ought to, uh, you know, we ought to just start doing that. And we have to do that in this world. I, I'm telling you, it is dismal when we look out and see what we see every evening on the news. Someone had said they're about ready to pull the cable. I'm, I'm moving towards that, that area, I think. It's just one thing after another, negative after negative. And, and here's what the problem is. We see all of that, and then when we get together, what do we talk about? We talk about what we saw. That's what we talk about. Wouldn't it be nice to see the Lord high and lifted up? It will control then our conversation, wouldn't it? Sure it would. If we could see him for who he is in our life every day, if, as we, if we could see him walking with us in all that we do, boy, our conversation would be changed. And it, it wouldn't be that kind of, you, you know, you run into some folk and, 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 and they're always talking about the Lord, but you know they don't know the Lord. They just, it's just language. It's just language. But, uh, but if we see the Lord as He is, high and lifted up, nothing is exalted above Him. Nothing is more important than Him. No conversation is greater than uh, the conversation that is pleasing in, uh, to God. And later on, you know, that, that's a problem that Isaiah had was the lip. <laughs> the things that he, he talked about, the things he said. Some, some say he was a coarse cursor. I don't know if the scripture supports that. But it does support the fact that in many ways we sin against God through our lips, through what we say. And so he sees him high and lifted up. Hebrews 12 and 25 gives us a kind of the church a warning. He says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him, uh, who, refused him who spoke on earth, much more, and that's talking about uh, uh, Moses perhaps, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, once more, I, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. It is scary within our own being. We, we sense and we approach the same place that uh, Isaiah is about to approach, the same place that uh, John uh, uh, approached when he was on the Isle of Patmos and he fell as if he was dead, uh, the same place that others who had come into the presence of the Lord uh, felt this, this horrible, fearful uh, feeling. W when we approach God, and we've, we've spoken about that in prayer, that the closer God gets to us, the more we, we cow down. Even though we know we're saved, even though we know that He's not approaching us to condemn us, what's happening is we're experiencing His holiness. And in this flesh... This flesh cannot stand before God. So I'm here in Christ Jesus. Nevertheless, I'm still in this flesh. And this flesh cannot glory in God's presence. It cannot approach God's presence. So I, I want to be close to him, but then there's a distance that I, I want to keep at the same time. And there's this dynamic, if you will, that goes on and leads us to a place that he, he led Isaiah eventually. And that is a place of repentance, a place of confession, a place where he's saying, oh, my goodness, I'm not worthy to stand before you, Lord. He goes on as he sees him high and lifted up. We sing that song so many times, this beautiful song. But do we see him that way? So many, so many times we've encouraged uh, ourselves that we ought to think about what we sing. We ought to think about what we say. And we ought to make that our testimony. Is he high and lifted up in my life? Is he, is he truly high and lifted up? He said, and his train filled the temple. And that train being this long robe we always associate with, with weddings, you know, with a long, long trail. And we, we, we 
associate that with beauty and glory and honor. The longer the train is, the more the glory. And here's God. He's seeing him. So this is a vision, obviously. He's not seeing God, but he is seeing that which he can, he can endure. Think about that. He is seeing what he can endure. He can't endure the face of God. He can't endure just standing face to face, mouth to mouth, nose to nose with God. But what he can endure, the purity of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, and just approaching into that environment, that he can, he can experience that, and so can we. His presence then, it says, fills the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should not come into a place like this, a place of worship, thinking that somehow the presence of God is floating around in here and we tap into it. Uh, forgive me for reiterating and repeating over and over again. That's why walking in the Spirit is so important. It will start to control us. It will control our thinking. It will control our walk. It, when when, when if, uh, we're told that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit, right, and not be drunk with wine... Here he's saying his temple was filled. Aren't we the temple? We should be filled with God, filled with his Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, of course, the God dwelt without or outside of his people, but with us, he dwells within us, within us. Further, in verse 2, he says, Above it, that is the throne, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with two they he covered his face, and with, with twine he covered his feet, and with twine he, he did fly. These are supposedly uh, flame-like angel beings, and they're the servants of the Lord, standing up by and waiting to do God's bidding. Now, it said it, 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 he, they stood, each one of them, as if they were standing before the commander waiting for orders. They didn't sit down. They stood before him waiting for orders. Now, notice this. With two of these wings, they covered his, he covered his face, looking, saying that I'm unworthy to look upon the face of God. But they did not cover their ears. They covered their face, they covered their eyes, but they didn't cover their ears. They had to hear. They didn't pry into the secret things of God. They were just there. But they were, they, were, they were poised and ready as soon as God said go. Whatever he spoke, they were ready to execute it. Boy, this is good for us. Then he talks about, that's the head now that's basically covered uh, with the exception of the ear, but the face. Then he says he covered his feet. And so we, we look at that as a a point of reverence, humility. And uh, I spoke last week about the, the summer is coming and, and everybody wants to uncover. And sometimes the uncovering or, or nakedness uh, is a form of, of sin without guilt. And, and the Lord uses nakedness and he uses that in the negative from the time that Adam and Eve sinned throughout Scripture. And he says that, so your nakedness does not show. We, we hear that over and over again. That you may be covered. And it's hard in this day and age to, to um, communicate that because it does involve what we wear. And what we wear is an attitude that we have toward God, and we have a hard time making that transition. Amen? See, it's the attitude that is, 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 is being talked about. They covered themselves. Here are angels who, uh, excuse me, but they're, they're more beautiful than any of us. And yet they're covering their face. They wouldn't dare go before God in a bold face. As if I can stand equal toe to toe with you. Even today, we, we, in some places, if you look someone in the eye, that means you got equal status with them. They didn't dare do that. They didn't dare do that. 
Many times when we pray, what do we do? We get on our knees and we bow down. We dare not just gaze in his, his face with, with an open boldness, uh, if you will, as if we're, we can stand eye to eye with God. And yet, prayer in, 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 in Scripture generally is standing, looking at God, but it's not with a bold face. It is with humility. It is with humility, not with equal status. But I'm, I'm just amazed at these angels or these seraphims who, who are just so gorgeous to look at would come before the presence of the glory and the holiness of God and cover their face. Four of the six wings that these seraphims have, they use to cover themselves. I just would hope that the, the Spirit would really get that down inside of us. Uh, Psalms 89, 7 says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. How we come before God is how we see Him. That's how we come before Him. We should never come laxed. We should never come uh, uh, carelessly. And finally, the last two wings, it says, and with two he did fly. And, and again, that, that is saying that he is ready to go. He doesn't let the wind take him. He doesn't soar over the wind and get to where he's going to go. But he flies. He, he, it's an instant. It's immediate. Uh, there's no questions. God says it. He's off to do it. Uh, that was a big saying in the 83s. God said it. That satisfies it. I'm going to do it. You know, uh, nobody was doing anything. But quoting that little phrase, and I, I might have quoted a little bit incorrectly, but the substance is there. Then we find something else that goes on here in, verse, uh, in the next verse 3. Is uh, the seraphim, they delight themselves in the holiness of God. Uh, th their chant back and forth seems to be continuous. And so we hear this great holy anthem being uh, shouted in heaven. And one cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh is the Lord of, of hosts. They saw him as holy. That's, that explains why they came to him the way they did. Because it's what they saw. It's what they saw. Ought to send goose pimples on us if we, let the, if we let the Spirit. You and I can't bring ourselves in the presence of the Lord. I love, that, I love uh, uh, what it says in Revelations about John. He says, and John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And so we know that the Spirit opened him up to the visions that he saw. Amen? But see, we, he was on the Isle of Patmos. Why? For the testimony of the Lord. He was walking in the Spirit already. So it's not that on Sunday morning he got up and got in the Spirit. He's been in the Spirit. And it just reiterated that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And because of that, the totality of his life, not one point in time in his life, but the totality of his life is characterized by walking and living in the Spirit. And as a result of that, he is then open to the visions that God wants to give. And he'll give them to you and I. And I'm not talking about seeing stuff, but visions as in the truth. Seeing God for who he is. Seeing him in all his power and all his authority. It opens us up. It brings us down. It humbles us. It creates and recreates in us the fear of God again, which has been so sorely lost. And where there is no fear of the Lord, there can be no holiness. There can be no holiness where there is no fear of the Lord because we don't see him in his great glory. Holiness, we need to understand, is that great, significant, and single characteristic of God. Holiness says that he is totally and absolutely separated from all that is sinful, all that is 
is corrupt. He is so separated from it, but it speaks of his, his pristine glory, if you will. It is the same song that is sang by the four creatures over in Revelations 4 and 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about the, him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And we sing that song <clears throat> almost by rote without any feelings whatsoever as to what it really means. You know, we, we got to put our mind to worship, our thinking to what am I doing Every one of us, I'll bet, at some time in our Christian life, and whether it's recent or past, that, you know, we're just standing and we're going through the motions. That's what we're doing. We're going through the motions. Uh, and how do we know we're going through the motions? Because we hear somebody sing out of tune and we look at them. We hear something that doesn't sound right to, and we look at them. Our focus is wrong. Our focus is wrong. That's why that's happening. We ought to be thinking about what am I doing? Holy, 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 God Almighty. And we ought to allow ourselves uh, to be brought into His presence by the Holy Spirit. Allow that to happen. Let go. It will not make us crazy. It, it will not create disorder. Perhaps a, a, a chill would, would run through us as we as we begin to allow ourselves to receive what God has drawn us here to receive. To allow ourselves to do that. Sometimes I think we're afraid to do that. I'm not saying give way to every little emotion that pops up. We've been down that road and we know it's flat. Doesn't transform our life. Doesn't change us at all. Oh, it lifts us up emotionally. But boy, I'll tell you what. When it lets us down, it lets us down without a parachute. It's a hard fall, and it's an even harder landing. And we're left broken more than before we got elevated emotionally. But when we're lifted up, when we let the Spirit bring us into God's presence because we experience His holiness, God lifts us up. And yes, our emotions come with it, but our mind is not disengaged. And we want to savor the experience in my mind. I want to remember this thing. I don't want to be taken out of my mind so I don't remember what happened. Because if, if that happens, then I, how, how, am, how is it going to affect me when I leave? It's not going to affect me at all. I've got to engage and I've got to see I am here. Uh, God has drawn me here and, and he is he wants to manifest and magnify himself in me. That's what he wants to do. Am I going to stop and, and not allow him to do that? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. What else could they say in his presence? Of all the things sometimes that we say to God, and, you know, we quote this and that scripture and that scripture, and I call it rubbing God down. We get in his presence, his holiness sticks out the most. It sticks out the most. Because it really brings us into, into focus in terms of who he is and who we are, doesn't it? God, this holiness says, God is independent of his creation, and yet he is in his creation. He wants to let his creation, you and I, know of his presence. And when he gave us his spirit, wow, what greater experience could you and I have? There is no greater experience. It is to continue that experience that's important. It is to continue that experience as we learn more and more and more about God, about ourselves, about what Christ did for us. As our understanding begins to increase, my humility also begins to increase. 
and I see the holiness of God. And when I see the holiness of God, my life is transformed. It is transformed. Suddenly the fear of God lives in my heart. I don't, I don't want... I don't want to walk out of his presence not afraid that he's going to do something to me, but that, that in his presence, oh, I just don't want to do anything that would push me out of that presence. So I'm, that's the fear of God. Sure, it's the fear of his authority. Sure, it's the fear of his judgment. But as the children of God, he has promised us that, that we shall never perish. Never he tells us to enter in with boldness, not bold-faced, but boldness, the boldness of Jesus Christ. In other words, we need to believe that Jesus has done it all for us. He's done it all, and if he's done it all, even though I can't enter in with my flesh, I can go under his cover. Amen? And that tension is with us. It stays with us. Thank God for it. Because it lets us know we are indeed the children of God. Thank God for it. That tension will never go away. Well, I know I'm in Christ and I can stand before God in absolute boldness and yet I stand in the fear of God. And it keeps me holy. <laughs> it keeps me holy. It keeps me on the straight and narrow. Holy, holy, holy. Lord is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I remember singing that one Sunday, and I was doing what I shouldn't do. I opened my eyes, and it was a sad, it was a sad look. I mean, we were singing it, boy, we were singing it to beat the drum. But it was kind of like the Lord is filled with the earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. We didn't mean that. We're just saying words. Everything we do when we walk in here ought to, you know, it ought to mean something to us. See, it doesn't mean anything if we ain't prepared before we get here. If we're not, a, we're, if we don't come with an expectation. If we don't come understanding God has set this little place aside that I can walk through those doors, I can divorce myself from this world, from all of my troubles, I can go into the presence of God and I can just praise Him because He has got me in His hands. I don't have a worry in the world. I don't have a thing to worry about. God's in control. I can come in now and I can, I can get on my knees, confess my sins, prepare my heart, open my mind up, say, Lord, come on in. The earth is full of His glory. You know, Romans 1.20 tells us, for the invisible things of Him from creation of the, of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. If, watch this, if God is saying here, the lost soul, who if they died tonight, will bust hell wide open, if I'm revealing to them my eternal power and Godhead, how much more will I reveal myself to them that I call my children? We ought to have that expectation. We ought to have that expectation. Yeah, we, re we, we get out there in the world and we get dirt all over us and we do this wrong and we do that wrong. Then we drag in here, we have a pity party and we go home and we just pick up and keep going. You know, we're not perfect people. But one of the things that makes us that, that, that can keep us on the on the on the straight and narrow is recognizing that. Coming in and saying, Lord God, you kept me this week, and you didn't keep me because of what I did in terms of glorifying you. No, you didn't keep me for that. I I, I fell short this week. And I fell short over here, but I'm here to glorify you. Because sin did not have its way this week because Jesus died and I'm here. It did not separate me from you. 
I'm going to glorify you, God. I, I want to thank you. But, Lord, I don't want to live that kind of life. See, it brings us down. It humbles us. It makes us begin to consider His glory. The glory of the Lord is, is that incomprehensible thing. It cannot be confined to some location. But when we're here, we're divorced from that stuff of the world. And we can have that intimacy that only occurs when the people of God come together. We have, we, we're still walking with God out there. He's still with us. But when we come in here together, something happens. Something happens and the glory of the, God, of the Lord shines even brighter. And so it's not confined to any location because Colossians 1.16 follows up and says this, For by Him we are all created that are in heaven, and uh, all things are created that are in heaven and are in the earth, visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. The things I know and the things I don't know. The things I see and the things I can't see. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created by Him and for Him. The glory of the Lord, then, is seen throughout the earth. Despite what our eyes see. See, we got to see that. Isaiah is seeing what he sees in a nation that is getting ready to be judged. They have fallen so far from God that God has said, they don't even know me anymore. And yet in the midst of that darkness, he sees the glory of God and all of this holiness. Man, we got to, we got, are you with me here? got to soak it in. you got to soak it in and go before God and just keep going and saying, Lord, that's what I want. I want to see you, Lord. I, I need that, Lord. I need that encouragement in my own life. We can have it. You know why? We already got it. <laughs> I'm not asking for something more, Lord, than what you gave me. You gave me your peace. You gave me your son. You gave me your spirit. You made me righteous. I'm not asking you for something, Lord. I want, those, I want all of that expressed in my life. Lord, take all of that away from me that hinders that expression in my life. See, that's getting honest with God. That's getting real with God. Amen? Amen? The glory of the Lord is perfect, says Psalms 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. He's separated from every evil. If something is going on that ain't right, don't say God's in it. Amen? The terror of the Lord is also associated with his glory if you look at verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke, shaking in the presence of God's holiness. Now, we've seen some counterfeit shaking. Amen? <laughs> so we're not talking about that. We're talking about the fear of God. You know, in these last days, the Scripture actually tells us that one of the characteristics, one of the major, major, major characteristics of this culture is there is no fear uh, of God before their eyes. And where there's no fear of God, there's nothing else. There can be nothing else but chaos and darkness and violence and sin over sin over sin. But in the presence of God, it says the doorpost, the post is what holds the doors up. Amen? Uh, only God is perfectly holy, and the angels themselves, who are created beings, who have never sinned a day in their life, in their creation, yet, yet, <laughs> they shake in the presence of God. Shall we not, when we come into his presence, should we not have the fear of God as we leave out of here? If only in this place 
we become fearful. If only in this place we become agitated in our spirit, man. That's not the fear of God at all. That's just guilt undealt with. That's just exposing the fact there's something wrong in my life and what is being said scares me, but I'm not willing to stop it. I'm just hoping he can get out of here before I break down. But when the fear of God breaks us down and causes us to repent and confess, that'll go with us. And then the fear of the Lord will keep us from going back to that thing. Because we recognize that when, I, when that thing was going on in my life, there was a separation from God. I was not sensing His presence. And I don't like living out of His presence. I don't want to live out of His presence. And that's part of the fear of God, is not wanting to live out of His presence. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, <clears throat> we, per we persuade men. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. He says that the fear of God is, ought to motivate us to preach the gospel. He's not just talking about those who would teach the word specifically, but all his people. That the fear of God would so radically change me. Isaiah is getting ready to accept the call of God to go prophesy. Amen? That's, what, that's what's going on here. And he's seeing all of this in preparation for going forward and prophesying for the Lord. Huh. Knowing the terror of God, the fear of God should bring forth an acute, an acute awareness of His holiness and my unholiness. And no matter what comes before my face, nobody can make me do anything. I must, I must say, Lord God, I stand in your presence 24-7, and I, it, I don't want anything in my life, Lord. I don't want anything in my life to interrupt your presence in my life. That means I'm going to have to do some things. So I'm going to have to be angry and sin not. I'm going to have to not judge another man's servant. I'm going to have to make some adjustments in my life in order that that presence never leaves me despite the assaults that are coming against me to, to break up the presence of God in my life. And believe me, you know just like I know, they come. And they don't come just as, well, here it is. They come wanting to arrest and take over my whole being. Head starts hurting, heart starts to beating. <laughs> Blood pressure goes up. It's a real attack. There's something going on. How do I respond to that? It's how I see God. How I respond to that is how I see God. And if I don't see God in that situation, and if I don't see the fact that this is here to interrupt my, my, my presence, the presence of God in my life, that's what it's there. It doesn't want me to experience that. See, that's digging down inside of me, isn't it? I can no longer look at somebody else and say it's your fault. And even if it's their, their, their fault, then what are you going to do about it? You ain't going to change them. Amen? So it doesn't even make sense to blame somebody else because if you just blame somebody else, it means that I'm going to keep doing this as long as you keep doing that. Well, they ain't going to stop doing that. Maybe that's their weakness. Amen? Maybe that's the burden I got to bear. And I bear that out of love. Because I see what sin does to folk. It weakens them. And I'm not going to be one that's going to pile on the, to that weakness. And, and I'm not going to be one that allows myself to be separated in terms of his presence and experience in his presence. Because we know nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's not what I'm saying. But I don't, I don't always experience that presence. I don't only really feel that presence. And again, I'm not talking about going by feelings. 
The smoke represented what the, the Jews would call the Shekinah glory. I know in a previous church, uh, in, a, in a previous movement that I kind of went through, the Shekinah glory was the thing that everybody used to get the crowd excited and and uh, they know what they're talking about, but they, they'd use that as if it was a, a term actually that's in Scripture, but Shekinah is not in the Scripture. So if you go and try to find it, you won't find that. It is something that described, the Jews would describe as that presence and that glory of God, the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. God wants that for all of us. Not a few. Not a few. It is the glory of God that, 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 that envelops us, if you will. It, it, it consumes us. It brings us down. It brings us to a place that we always want to come back to, even though it's a fearful place at times. 1 Kings 8, and 10 and 11 says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the, the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Do you see? The glory of the, of the, of the Lord. That glory is in us. Amen? Through his spirit. It's not an external glory. Uh, there's no smoke going to come down in here. If it does, get out the building. Don't stand around here talking about glory. <laughs> because that's just how they'll find you. <laughs> God says, look, I, you remember Jesus prayed in, in John 17? I have glorified you. And he wants us. He says, I want these that have followed me. And I'm paraphrasing this. Because he says a lot there in 17. I want them. I'm going to leave them. I'm, I want you to glorify them in me. That they be glorified in me. That's you and I. That's you and I. He wants us to glorify him. How can we do that? Except understand that his holiness. And show forth that holiness in our life. That separation from everything that God hates. i got to just separate myself from it. And it's got to start with me. Our problems, we always start, we got a list of folks that we're going to straighten out. You know what I mean? we got a list of folks where we're going to say, now, D, I need 10 of them tapes because such and such and such and such need that and don't, and don't get one for ourselves. Because <laughs> we don't need it. They need it. Man, they, they needed to be here. They needed to hear that. You just lost the whole message. If they needed to hear it, God would have brought them here. <laughs> it's like he brought us here. And we responded to that. Amen? We've got to get it first. Ezekiel said, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the, from the, from the cherim and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of of the Lord's glory. No sin. No sin. No wrong. Don't buy into, but I'm just a human. Da, da, da. You don't have to say that. That's, that's a given. Well, I'm not perfect. That's a given. But that's not an excuse for not moving on. And too many times we're using that as an excuse that I'm just not perfect. And there ain't no perfect human being around. And all this foolishness we use as an excuse not to move on to perfection. Which God calls us to his holiness and his godliness. Amen? In all of this that, God, that, that, that Isaiah sees, it would be meaningless. If it didn't do something to him. And so Isaiah, in, in the verse 5, sees himself. As he sees the holiness of God, he sees himself as he ought to see himself. He sees himself, perhaps for the first time, for who he really is. Then said I, woe is me. Why did he say it? For I am undone because 
I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We've been talking about holiness for some two months or more. And we've been walking up to this place right here that tells us that unless we see God for who he is, there will never be any true repentance. There'll never be any real confession and there'll never be any change in our life from what it is right now. Though we have the capability for change, we will not experience that change. And as we experience that change that God is doing, we are also experiencing His holiness, His godliness. We're also experiencing His glory. Simple. Paul said you've gotten away from that kind of simplicity that's in Christ. That simple thing of, of, of obedience because I love Him, not because He's got a whip out. He's going to get me if I don't do this or if I don't do that. He's going to, boy, he's standing there to get me. He already got Jesus. And he got him good. He may chastise us, yes. But he got and put it on Christ. Then I said, woe is me. And we might think that Isaiah would be happy to see the Lord. <laughs> You know, I thought about that, and I thought about some of the foolishness we, we've seen over the last two decades that have, have rushed into churches, and, and we find people laughing, and you remember the laughing ministry? The preacher gets up to preach, and everybody starts laughing, and, and everybody's just happy, and then we've got these foolish folks who are always talking about, you know, well, everything's just fine. You know, they're just so happy in the Lord. When Isaiah saw the Lord, happiness could not describe or characterize that experience. He saw himself for who he was. You know, it is disturbing to us the closer we get to God. There is a joy in the work that we do for the Lord. And we are to allow the joy of the Lord to be our strength in times of trouble and all of that. But you know, there's those little times when we get close to God. And let me just tell you something, friends. I don't want to say, I mean, it, it's different. It, it, it's not this happy, hey, I, boy, how you doing? Man, it's been a long time. Give me some, you know. Uh-uh. It's none of that crazy stuff. It's none of this giggling and this 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 facade that folks put on like there's nothing going on in their life. When we experience God, boy, the light comes on us like it's never come on us before. The light shines in us brighter than it has ever shown before. And let me tell you the last time that happened to everyone in here that's saved, it happened on the day you got saved. The light went on. The fear was there. The love of God was impressed upon us in the midst of this, this fear. And we knew it was God. We knew it was Him. None of us at the day of salvation said, Wait a minute. I need to try the spirits whether they be a God or not. None of us said, Maybe that's the devil coming to deceive. None of us said that. God made it so clear, and he didn't make it clear based on your or my intellect, our knowledge, or anything else. He made, that, he made it clear. He opened that door. He revealed himself. He wants to just keep doing that in us. That's all he wants to do. We had become so destitute that, 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 that when he came, he had prepared us along the way, and that we, just, we were just so open to him, and Boy, we couldn't have resisted if we wanted to. Why? Because we had been to the bottom of the barrel, if you will, in whatever way that was that God uh, got our attention. However that was, it was enough for us to see. Amen? Isaiah understood one thing. When he got in the presence of God, if justice was to be done, he was a dead man. He was a dead man. When you and I get in the presence of God and we sense that, we ought to sense that same feeling. Boy, if it weren't for Jesus, where in the world would I be? 
in order to create a shaking in us, deep down inside of us. Sometimes uh, we go silent. In, in be, I mean, what is it that we're going to say to the Lord? Isaiah is awakened, and he's awakened right to the bone of the holiness of God. Have you ever sat in church sometime and <clears throat> the word is going forth and something inside you just starts to work in you? And you know, hey, that's, that's God. There's something going on. That's God dealing with me. Never, ever ignore that. Never. That's the point that God is saying, do something. Do something. Don't you leave this place until you deal with that situation. But the fear of God, woe is me. Manoah felt that when, when he said to his wife, we shall surely die because we've seen God. Job said that the hair of my body stood up when God passed before him. Daniel was left with no strength when he saw the great vision of the Lord. Zacharias, when he saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. <laughs> says here, and behold, an angel stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were greatly afraid. This is no giggly happy occasion as the world counts happiness. It surely isn't. And I think it's a reason why we kind of uh, you see, it's not you and I willingness to be so. It is God willing to reveal himself to us. And he is making himself in many different ways and coming in at many different angles trying to let us know, I'm inviting you in. You are fighting to stay out. It's not a problem with God. We got to let... We got to let go of some of them high places in our high mind, don't we? Isaiah is waking to the depth of his own sin nature. He's feeling unholy. He's feeling like he's not worthy. And so he confesses, I am a man of unclean lips. <laughs> I'm a sinner undone. I'm a man who's offended you, God, in word. James tells us what? If, if we offend not in word, we're, we're pretty good, aren't we? And so we get religious on that and we say, well, that, that means, you know, in the word. But you know this old lips? Uh, Mark tells us, chapter 7, 21, he says, you know, the, them lips, uh, the heart. <laughs> Amen. The mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. And so when the, when the lips are offending God, it's, it's simply exposing what's really and truly in our heart. We've got to ask ourselves, how many of us sitting in here tonight have unclean lips? How much gossip has come out of our lips? How much meanness has come out of our lips? How many exaggerations have flowed from our mouth? How much slander has followed, fallen from our lips? How much, how much false accusations against brothers and sisters have we carried without evidence? How much unwarranted complaining do we do before God? James asked the question, does, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain bring forth both salt and fresh water. He says, these things ought not to be. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 15 tells us that what should be coming from our lips and it says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Not only did he confess his sins, bear with me a while. And he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. He said, ain't none of us worthy. Ain't none of us worthy. And I know that he's not just trying to condemn and he's not just trying to judge folks. He says this and he gives a reason for that. At the end of verse 5, he says, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what brought him to that conclusion. It is the same thing 
that will bring us to the same conclusion if we allow the Spirit of God to do that. Look at verse 6. Then he's got this big excuse. Now, I ain't going. There's too much sin in my life. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it, Lord. Then, verse 6 says, flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. Notice that he flew. He immediately responded to what God, uh, what, what, what God wanted him to do. And watch this. This is for you and I. God immediately responded to a broken and a contrite heart. Immediately. He left no gap. When, when Isaiah confessed, repented, when he was broken, immediately God responded. He says, that, God said, that's what I require. That's what I require. Amen. That's why it's so important to be honest with ourselves. Amen. He saw the king as he was. He saw the king as the Lord of hosts. He got close up and personal. Too many of us are walking across the street from God and waving at him every now and then. We don't want to get too far out of his distance, but we don't want to get too close either. <laughs> so one of them came and, and, and he flew over and he taken the thongs off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and he said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy purge. The hindrance from Isaiah serving God had been removed. When God saved us, the hindrance from us safe for serving God was removed. Amen? But we've lost sight of the holiness of God. We've lost sight of the power and authority of God. And so the, 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 the answer comes out of heaven in verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord now speak, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Well, if Isaiah's saying, I've got unclean lips, the whole nation's got unclean lips, and nobody's repenting, then this question makes sense, doesn't it? Who am I going to send? Who am I going to send? Now, the angel has just cleansed and purged Isaiah, so now Isaiah no longer has that excuse. But God does not force him into going who am i going to send now i heard what you said over here you're a man of unclean lips i heard you say that and i know that the rest of them are rotten and i know you're not the only one i've ever come to they've rejected me but now you're clean now who am i going to send i know the rest of them christians out there ain't doing what they ought to be doing but i, I i've opened your eyes what are you going to do See, that's how, that's how we are. We don't do something because somebody else is doing it. But listen to Isaiah. As quickly as God comes, as quickly as he purges him, as quickly as God then asks him the question, who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am. Send me. Man, that's what, that's what God's asking. He didn't call us out week after week to hear sermons. I can tell you that. That's not why he's calling us out. He's calling out to kind of complete that sanctification in us and, and bring us to that point uh, where we can actually start serving him in our everyday life. He, he doesn't bring us out here to, to uh, uh, throw our sins in the street, so to speak. To condemn us, make us feel bad? No, sometimes we do. <laughs> but he's saying, I, I'm here to make some corrections and to tell you how those corrections need to be made. And, and that they're, they're made when you see me as I am and you come to me. Preacher can't change you. That's not his job. His job is to tell the truth. I, if you receive that truth, I will change you. I will do that thing. But you got to see me with the right kind of eyes. 
And Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. He saw him, and, and you know, I could imagine when he saw those angels, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, he's there and he wants to join, but he can't join because he's got nasty mouth. He got naughty mouth. He can't join in the course. But then the old angel comes and, you clean now, buddy. You can sing that song now because I've just made you holy. Mm. Isn't that what God did with us? Tell me he didn't. And the question is, when he asks us, who shall I send? Do we stand up and say, send me? There's nothing more important in our life that we can do. Nothing. Yeah, it'll cost us something. Yeah, it feels awkward. Yeah, it doesn't fit in with the world. But let me tell you, when we love the Lord, we don't want to get out of his presence. <laughs> and if that's what it takes to stay there, friend, I'm staying. How about you? Can I get an amen there? <laughs> Send me. Here I am. The assurance that he was forgiven caused him to respond in the positive to God. When Paul was thrown off that horse, amen, immediately he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? First thing I, what will you have me to do? He saw the Lord. Whether he was in the body, out of the body, I don't know. Some 14 years ago, I was taken up into heaven. I've seen things I can't talk about. And man, that, that was just too exciting for me. But we saw Paul say to that one that caught him up, what will you have me to do? We've got to make some of those decisions in our life because God has brought us to this point here in this congregation. He has, he has really brought us to this point. And he said, okay. I've cleaned out the brush. I've yanked the weeds out from around you. I know you've been through a lot of stuff, and I know there's a lot had to get out of your brain, and I, I know you're, you're learning and you're learning, but now it's time to step up. It is time to say yes or no. And it's not relative necessarily to the work we do in this, in this building, but Am I saying yes to God that he can use me when I leave this place? Because there's somebody where you and I walk are so tired of hearing sermons. They need to see one. They, see, they need to see me and you living for God the way we ought to be living instead of always on their back about something. Are you, are you with me? It's the life. It's the life. That life came from seeing God in the proper light. And it began then to control the life of Isaiah. And moving forward, we'll, we'll hear Isaiah's boldness and God revealing more to him simply because he said, yes, send me. Amen? Stand with me tonight.